So this session will last for approximately one hour, but may go a little longer depending on the number of questions you have during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, please tweet along with us tonight using hashtag beefwebinar. I'd also like you to know that we are recording this session, and so you will be able to watch it later if you did miss anything tonight, and I will email out a link to that recording after the webinar is done, along with some links where you can find a bit more information on the topic we're covering tonight. So of course, for the presentation tonight, you'll be able to hear and see our presenters, but we can't hear or see you. So if you want to communicate with us, just type into the small chat window in the control panel on the side of your screen. And if you have a question or comment for me or either of the presenters tonight, that's the place where you can do it. So feel free to send in your questions at any time and we'll answer them towards the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow tonight, it might help to close the webcam window. This means you won't be able to see us, but it hopefully make the audio come through a bit more clearly and get the slides to load a little faster. All right, so this is what we're going to be covering tonight. We'll start off with Kathy, Kathy Larson talking about fixed time, time AI and does it pay? We'll next turn it over to Dr. Colin Palmer who will talk about how to use AI. We'll then open it up to questions from you and follow with some closing remarks and where you can find a bit more information on the topic. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce Kathy Larson. Kathy is Kathy is the research economist at Western Beef Development Center. Her research program is interested in helping producers to understand the value of measuring both financial and production records in order to manage in order to manage and increase pro their profit potential. So take it away, Kathy. Okay. Perfect. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, everything's good. All right, so I'm going to just move to my slides, and there's my slide deck should be up here, and I'm just going to minimize my little control panel on the side. There you go. All right, so very excited to be able to uh, deliver a webinar for the Beef Cattle Research Council. I've participated in them before, listened to them uh, live in both recorded versions of it, but I haven't had the opportunity to be a speaker. And um, so I work for the Western Beef Development Center, and I'm going to speak specifically on some research results from a one-year demonstration project that we did at Western Beef um, directly in line with fixed time AI. So I'm going to give you a little bit of data on uh, some survey results talking about the utilization of estrus synchronization in AI. Then we'll move into uh, just costs of maintaining a herd sire. Sometimes it's, it's, it's a good idea to get your head around how much it actually costs you to have your bull battery. And then I'll move into some of the results from that fixed time AA project, uh, the one-year demonstration project that we carried out at the Termonde Ranch, which is part of Western Beef's uh, research ranch located at Lanigan, Saskatchewan. So here's a chart from the Western Canadian cow-calf survey that we would have wrapped up last February. We uh, rolled the survey out across Western Canada with a number of helping hands, including the Beef Cattle Research Council. We had a little over 400 individuals complete the survey, and one of the questions within it was the utilization of artificial insemination and estrus synchronization. And you can see here the results by province uh, with most of the provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, having similar levels of AI and estrus synchronization use. BC seems to be quite a bit lower, and it could just be a result of the, the producers from the province that did complete the survey, not reflective of that province's, say, actual use of AI and estrus synchronization. Uh, where do we find use in the U.S.? I can look at the National Animal Health Monitoring System, the survey that's conducted in the U.S. Uh, the survey was last done in 2007-8, and here's just a cover of that document if you would try and go find it yourselves online. And I've just taken a screen capture of the question they asked about utilization of estrus synchronization and AI. And they've split out the results by herd size. You can see each of the columns, but if you take your direction and focus to the last column in that table, it's been um, circled with a little red rectangle. On average, across uh, the U.S., 8% of producers use estrus synchronization, and 
7.6% uh, use artificial insemination. So all this to say, natural service breeding appears to be most common, and probably some of the hesitancy is just the feeling that it's quite a bit more expensive to use fixed time AI, and so that's um, where my presentation is, is headed at, is to give you some, some numbers on the costs that uh, we incurred when uh, using fixed time AI at the research ranch. So I showed you that uh, chart by um, province for the Western Canadian Cow-Calf Survey. If we look overall of, of the 400 and so producers that completed it, only 18% indicated that they use AI and 11% estrus synchronization. But I think it's important, have you ever given any thought to how much it's costing you to maintain your herd sires? Do you have a good feel or you've, you've seen some numbers that you know what it costs to have those herd bulls around if you're doing natural service breeding? So I can walk you through an example. Last year, in 2015, uh, Termundi Ranch, Western Beefs Ranch, purchased only two herd bulls is all we needed to, to finish off our, our complement of bulls for our 350 cow herd. And our ranch manager told me last week that we paid $4,000 a bull for them, which I think was probably a fairly good deal given some of the prices that were happening last year. Um, I've increased it in this example, you'll see a purchase price of 4500 for the example I'm working through. I have to figure out how many years of use I'm going to get out of that bull. I have four years of use. Obviously, if you're going to walk yourself through this example, put in your actual purchase price, your expected years of use. And then four years out, what do you think that bull is going to bring you uh, as a butcher bull, uh, the call value on it? I have it at 80 cents a pound, and I fully realize that prices are quite a bit higher than that right now, but I don't know where they're going to be four years out. And if I look four years back, 80 cents a pound is a pretty good price. So we'll leave it at that for this example. So uh, for every year that that bull is in your herd, it's essentially depreciating or declining in value by $725. So it says depreciation value each year. We'll work that into the cost of maintaining them. Then you'll also have is just general maintenance costs, so it's feed and the yardage and the labor that's associated, the bull test, that uh, the semen test that you'll perform on him annually. I have that pegged at about $750. Then I'm going to build in a risk of loss at 10% of the purchase price of the bull, so just a chance that maybe he'll injure himself, get foot rot, um, and not be able to, to breed the females, and you'll have to have a, a different game plan or have a spare bull. So the total costs based on these assumptions is at 19.25, and if I expect that bull to service 25 females, that's an average or a cost of $77 per female. So that's for natural natural service. Now, if you think one second here. So if you think about what you paid for bulls last year, I can give you some numbers from uh, some herd sales that happened last year. So some of you may be familiar if you're from Western Canada listening in tonight of the quantum sale. It's happening this weekend. Uh, these are the numbers from last year. There was uh, 360 head or so sold for an average price of just under 7,000. So 68.77 was the average price for the bulls in that sale. An Angus sale from this past December, uh, 114 lots in that sale, and the average price was just over $10,000 a bull. And then I'm going to give you a Gelby sale from last March, just under 90 head, and the average price was $7,000. So if I do a weighted average of how much those bulls uh, sold for, average, average uh, price is about $75.60. So if I redo that example I just showed you with a purchase price of $7,500 but keep everything else pretty much the same, the four years of use, the same call value, the same annual maintenance costs, obviously the risk of loss increases because it's based on the purchase price, you get total costs approaching $3,000 per year for that bull. And if you spread it over a uh, servicing of 25 females, it's approaching $120 per female serviced. So now we'll shift into the, the uh, results of the demonstration study, study. So this was breeding that occurred in the summer of 2013. 
So the calf crop was born and weaned in 2014. We had 40 cows that we bred just natural service with a 60 day breeding season and then 40 cows that we bred fixed time AI and then set, or 10 days after they were bred AI we exposed them to a cleanup bull for 47 days. So we were comparing these two groups of 40 cows. They were then preg checked three months after the AI date in mid-October. And so the protocol that we followed was using a seeder and it was uh, the CoSync um, program and I just have a little bit of details here just the products that we use the gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH we use the product cysterelline and then we give them two shots of that and then the prostaglandin F2 alpha we use estromate and we did hire a trained technician to perform the AI so there may be some of you who are trained in AI and can uh, AI your own females but we did bring someone in to AI the cows at the Tremonde Ranch it was just the uh, technician with the semen company that we deal with. So what were our costs on these 40 cows that we did F, uh, fixed time AI on? I'll break it out for you here. For the two shots of GNRH it was six dollars. For the prostaglandin F2 alpha it was five dollars a female. For the cedar it was seventeen dollars. Uh, for the additional supplies it worked out to about a dollar. For the semen, we did use uh, a few different bulls. There's actually 120 cows that we fixed time AI'd in that uh, 2013 year, but we only grabbed out 40 for this small demonstration uh, comparison study. So it was about $27 a straw that we were paying for the semen. The AI technician costs $18 per female. And that includes some mileage that they would charge to come out to the operation. And then when you figure in that there's three shoot runs and you need to have a, a decent handling system to move those females through, that works out to about $13 a female. And then the exposure to a cleanup bowl afterwards I have at $42.50. So you tally that all up and you're at about $130 a cow. So when you think about the price of that $7,500 uh, bull and the example I showed you was costing about $120 a cow, uh, this fixed time AI was costing just $10 more. So what was our results? What were we looking to compare and what numbers did we capture? We capture a lot of data at Western Beef and here's a, a fairly busy chart showing those. Uh, so you can see that we had the natural service was 40 females, artificial insemination 40 females. Pregnancy rate was slightly higher for the AI cows at 97.5% versus 92.5. Calving span was uh, five days shorter, 64 versus 69. Calving rate was a little bit higher as well. So it's just an indication of some of those cows um, slipping their calf from when they were confirmed pregnant to when the calving season started. Birth weight was slightly higher on the AI side. Calving distribution uh, was actually higher a bit on the natural service side, but I think uh, nothing to be concerned about here. We actually target that you want 60% uh, of your females calving in those first 21 days, and for both groups of females, we were over 80%. On wean rate, we had 90% of the AI cows weaning a calf and 77.5% on the natural service. So just some calf death loss occurring there. And uh, then you see the adjusted weights, 205 day weights, 629 versus 606. So the calves ended up being lighter, which may not be um, what you're always looking for. You're, I think a lot of times we would tout that you're using AI to get the superior genetics and uh, higher weaning weights. But for this, for this example, this one year demonstration, we did see slightly lower adjusted weaning weights. But given all the other improvements in the production indicators with the conception and the wean rate, we had an additional 4,170 pounds of weaning weight or pounds of calf weaned. And if I look at what prices were when we weaned these calves at the start of October of 2014, that additional weaning weight was worth $11,250. So one way to look at this, how I would um, look at it at an, in an economic manner is doing something called partial budget analysis. So you use partial budget analysis 
to assess management practices that you're considering adopting on your operation. And what it does is it kind of pieces everything out so that you look at increases and decreases in both your costs and your revenues that result from a change in your management practice. So you're thinking of doing something different. What, what uh, costs increase, what costs decrease, which revenues increase, which revenues decrease. And once you have figured those out, you um, counsel, each, counsel them out and you end up with your net change in profit. So I did that for this example of the implementation of fixed time AI. And you can see it just shown here in this uh, four quadrant little table. So the increased costs are in the top left corner and that's just simply the costs associated with implementing fixed time AI. So the drugs, the cedars, the supply, the purchase of the semen. This is just on the 40 cows, uh, the cost of the AI technician. That all works out to just over $3,300. On the increased revenue side, so we had improvements in wean rate. We had additional pounds of calf weaned. And the value of that additional pounds of calf was uh, $11,250, $11,250. And the bottom left-hand side, so that's the reduced revenues that come about from in utilizing fixed time AI. So what ends up having reduced revenues? Well, you don't have to have as many bulls uh, if you're capturing some of your conception through the use of AI. So reduce call bull sales. And because we had improved conception, we had less opens to sell. So we had reduced revenues of $2,600. On the reduced cost side, uh, with the need of fewer bulls, you have fewer bulls being sold, fewer bulls being purchased, and improved conception also meant that you have fewer replacements that you have to purchase. So the reduced cost was $49.25. If you take the increased revenues and the reduced costs, so the $11,250 and the $49.25, and you subtract the increased costs and the reduced revenues, you end up with a net position, a net change in profit of 10,270. And this is just for a one-year example at Western Beef. Uh, everything's gonna depend, it will depend from year to year and it's gonna depend from operation to operation. So just in closing of this short uh, demonstration example of the use of fixed time AI, I think it's important to note that we have a national beef strategy. I hope that many of you or most of you are aware of our national beef strategy. There's several uh, targets and pillars within that strategy and one of them is to increase production efficiency by 15% by the year 2020. And in within that strategy to achieve that target, increased uptake of AI, commercial producers was mentioned as one way to reach the target. So that's why it's an important topic to, dis to, to chat about is because it, it is listed um, in the national beef strategy. And as I've shown, the cost of fixed time AI is actually not that much higher than natural service. If you're paying $7,500 or more for a bull, the example I showed with the $7,500, it was really only $10 more to go the way of fixed time AI. Our one-year findings from a demonstration project showed that you ended up with more pounds of calf weaned. And the partial budget analysis uh, for our one-year demonstration had over $10,250 net change to profit. So if you're interested in learning more about this one-year demonstration and uh, what we undertook, there's actually a fact sheet that's been posted to the Beef Cattle Research Council. I'll just quickly click here. If you navigate to the Beef Cattle Research Council's fact sheets, you'll be able to find the whole study. We did uh, complete the study last March, and um, the principal investigator is Dr. Bart Lardner, my coworker. So you can find out the full details of what I've shared here with you. And so with that, I'll leave my contact information. You can reach me by email, by cell phone, on Twitter. Visit our website for additional uh, research studies that we have underway and also you can find our research findings on our YouTube channel. So with that I'm just going to pass on, return the, the controls to. Perfect. Well thanks Kathy um, and just to let everybody know as well I will also be um, providing you that link in the follow-up email with the link to tonight's recording as well. So. Um, we will have that and you'll be able to 
see the fact sheet there as well. So we're just going to, before we continue on to the, our next speaker, I'm going to launch some poll questions. So these will allow you to participate in tonight's webinar. So your answers to these are anonymous. So you can just respond by clicking your answer um, on the screen. So here's the first one. So is the majority of your herd commercial or purebred? So you can um, click which one fits your operation best. I'll give you a couple seconds here. All right. So it looks like about 75% of our producers tonight are commercial producers, whereas about 25% are purebred. So our next question here, do you currently utilize AI or ester synchronization? All right, so it looks like about 58% of you do use it and 42% say no that they don't. So another question just relating to that, have you used AI or ester synchronization in the past, yes or no? All right, and similar results on that one with about 61% saying yes and 39% saying no that they hadn't. And we'll just have one more here just to kind of lead us into Dr. Palmer's talk. So what do you consider an acceptable conception rate to a single AI meeting? So 0 to 30%, 31 to 50%, 51 to 70%, 71 to 90%, or 91 to 100%. All right, so I'll just give you a couple more seconds here. So there we go. So most of you, it looks like in between that 51 to 100%, so 40% with saying from 50 to 70, 47% um, from 70 to 90, and 13% of you say from 90 to 100. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Colin Palmer. So, and just a reminder too, if you do have any questions for Kathy or Colin during the presentations tonight, you can type them in at any time and we'll answer them at the end of the hour here. So Colin is an associate professor at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine in Saskatoon and where he is actively involved in providing clinical services as well in the large animal clinic and field service areas as well. All right. so take it away and actually Colin sorry you're still got your mute on I believe okay how's that there you go looks good okay thank you good oh, there we go all right so I'm supposed to talk about how to use AI tonight all the sort of practical aspects to help you out if you'd like to get started and so I've started off with uh, some hurdles to employing AI, some problems that a lot of producers run into or reasons that they don't want to give it a go. Um, our ultimate goal with uh, using utilizing artificial insemination is that we basically have to put semen in the right place at the right time. There's nothing more uh, complicated than that. So the biggest hurdle that we often hear about is, is technical problems. Um, liquid nitrogen tanks may be needed, um, all the other equipment for thawing the semen, um, how to inseminate. It takes a lot of practice sometimes to learn how to, to put it through the cervix and deposit it just in the uterine body. So lots of people are just, uh, they're daunted by that. They look at taking AI courses, try and figure out what's going on. The next problem, of course, is uh, involves uh, putting it in at the right time, and we all know that uh, cows have heat cycles, or, or uh, and, and during that heat cycle, they display esters for only a short period of time. Um, usually, it's an average of a 21-day cycle, and the duration of heat is somewhere between about 12 and 18 hours, with a range of about 2 to 50 hours, and in that period of time, the only true sign of a, that a cow is actually in esters or heat is that she'll stand to be mounted. 
So with that being said, that can be often very, very difficult to see. Um, lots of times we, uh, some animals won't show it, some animals show it for a short period of time. Sometimes there are others that are coming into heat uh, that, that may be uh, working with a, with a more timid animal and so we, we don't see it. So sometimes we're relying on what we call secondary signs. So maybe they mount uh, or chin rest on other animals. There might be some increase in bellowing, restlessness. Um, sometimes uh, we find helpful some clear mucus discharge that's coming from the vulva. Um, in, in milking cows, they certainly I'll hear r uh, reports of uh, decreased milk production, swollen vulva. Um, that could be really hard to, to determine. Certainly one thing that we know for sure is if you see a red uh, mucus uh, discharge uh, coming from the vulva, sometimes it looks almost like uh, frank blood, it's really too late. That usually means that you've missed the ovulation window uh, by at least a day. And uh, one thing we know for sure is that we need to get that semen into the uterus uh, at least uh, about four to six hours before ovulation. After that, our, our conception rates go down quite substantially. So how do we uh, go about detecting heat in these animals? So some good old rules of thumb is that we should be observing cattle at least twice daily, usually at 12 hour intervals uh, for at least 20 to 30 minutes. If you can spend a little bit longer period of time there, that's even better. Um, try to observe cattle in a paddock with good footing. Um, I've often found uh, pasture has worked well, uh, putting them in breeding fields has worked really quite well for us. It can be problematic if it's, uh, if it's a really windy, rainy type of day. I found that the cattle will often uh, kind of huddle up under a tree or get out of the wind and, and may not be uh, uh, as inclined to show the behavior. This is a bit of a joke that I put in here. Watch the cows, not the gophers, and that's a reminder for me. Um, on beautiful sunny spring days when I'm out there heat checking, I sometimes get concerned about uh, gophers that I see running around and, and where was that hole and, and should I do something about it. My wife has always done a much better job of actually focusing on the cows. Um, keeping records is very, very useful. Um, as we know, animal, cows come into heat roughly every three weeks, and certainly if you write it down and uh, and, and and you think that there was some behavior, you're not really sure, certainly following up uh, about three weeks later and you see the same type of behavior, that's a pretty good assurance that that's, that's the type of heat that she displays. Uh, other things you can do is use estrus detection aids, uh, tail head markers, uh, the KMAR heat mount detector is something that's been quite useful in some herds. Uh, some people go to using uh, teaser bulls that have, uh, have been surgically altered to help them out. Um, they can also use hormone treated heifers and things like that. Nevertheless, no matter how you're doing it, heat detection is a time consuming activity. And when I talked to producers that, that utilized AI 20 and 30 years ago, they just said, you know, this was, it just took too, too much time. We just, we just got out of it, um, didn't have time to heat check. I'm, I'm trying to put a crop in, I'm trying to do something else and just not worth it. Also, we, we learned over the years in, in all our studies that not all ca cattle display typical estrus type of behavior. In fact, there's probably 10 to 15% of them that really don't display much at all to, that's, that's obvious to the human eye. It, it might be useful for a bull, but certainly not useful for, uh, for us. So uh, the other thing that, that uh, can be kind of problematic is if you did think that she was in heat and you bred her, um, but uh, if she does not get pregnant, when will she return to heat? And you know that causes a lot of confusion because I've been throwing out the, the three week uh, number for you folks and uh, that equates to about 21 days. Well in actual reality that can be quite variable. And the reason for that is, is that cows have what we call follicular waves. You see follicles are what develop on the ovaries and inside the follicles are the eggs that will be ovulated and ultimately fertilized. So it's follicles that we end up monitoring and, and uh, of course as I've just said they occur in waves. Now a large percentage of our cattle either have two waves of follicular development or three waves of follicular development. So in a two wave cow um, the second wave is the one that actually will ovulate. The first wave will actually develop and then just regress. And the reason it does that is because there's a corpus luteum present, which is the, the structure that, that produces progesterone, and uh, a cow can't ovulate under the influence of progesterone. In the three-wave example, she has one, two, and then the third wave, she ovulates. And really, when you look at this, this is all these unovulated, unovulatory waves represent a loss of genetic material. So those, those follicles grow up to a certain size, they have the potential to ovulate, and they are wasted. 
And so with lots of our programs, we come along and, and we're able to not only focus on the second wave or the third wave, we're actually able to, to hone in on some of these other waves through the use of the hormones that, uh, that we employ. Another important thing for you to realize is that these cows with two waves of follicular development have an 18 to 20 day cycle length, whereas the cows with a three wave uh, of, of follicular development have a 20 to 23 day cycle. So in actual reality, that 21 day cycle that we talk about is really just an average and uh, there's one, some people say there's no such thing as a cow that has a true 21 day cycle. So they're either 18 to 20 or to 20 to 23. Now for the purposes of our fixed time AI work, um, and, and especially for what I want you to take home tonight, um, this whether they're two waivers or three waivers largely isn't that important to you. It's important for you just to understand a little bit about the cycle, those follicles that we are going to focus in on, and the reasons for this variation in estrous cycle length. Okay, so I wanted to kind of focus in here a little bit more. So this is an example with the three waves and ovulation occurring. I'd like to point out that ovulation occurs after the animal goes out of heat. So she actually has her standing heat. She's receptive to, uh, to a live male. Um, certainly you could inseminate her in that period of time, but she actually ovulates after she goes to heat. Because the length of heat is variable, it's really good to kind of measure it, uh, the, the time of ovulation from the onset of heat rather than after she goes out, out of heat. So we reproductive people, we talk about uh, ovulation occurring an average of 27 hours after the onset of heat, which is a range of 22 to 32. This kind of information becomes important to you because if you're able to breed a cow ideally when you, when you really should or to optimize pregnancy rates, it would be the latter half of when she's, sorry I'm moving around with my cursor here, it would be in the latter half of when she's in actually standing heat. That gives the sperm time to get into the uterus, move through the uterus, move up the fallopian tubes or oviducts and get to the egg and they have to go through some, some changes before they're able to fertilize the egg and that takes a, a, just a few hours. If you put the semen in too far in advance of when she ovulates, then that semen just won't be viable. It gets there and it dies off. Now, semen from bulls, um, natural service sires, uh, will actually survive a, a little bit longer in the reproductive tract than semen that's been frozen and thawed. And that's a little bit of a disadvantage is because the freezing thawing process uh, does kind of compromise the sperm cells. And also in the insemination dose, there's a lot fewer sperm than in a natural service thing. Now, the ability to fertilize once frozen and then thawed varies between bulls. So some bulls are a little bit better than others. And uh, certainly in the beef industry, that is, uh, or the beef AI uh, industry, that is something that's being studied a little bit more intently now to look at some of those differences between bulls and, uh, and how we might uh, make improvements for certain bulls. Okay, so we've talked a lot about heat and we've talked about follicular waves and so on. And uh, is it possible to have a successful AI program without heat detection? And my short answer to that is, of course, yes. And what sort of solutions do I have? And the two main things I want to talk about is hiring technical support. Um, lots of times we think about getting into AI and we think about taking courses and, and getting all these protocols together. Um, the reality is most new inseminators require uh, quite a bit of practice be before they become really, really good at inseminating. I was once uh, uh, surprised and, uh, and, and then also not surprised. I had a producer friend, uh, he had about 100 heifers that he wanted to inseminate in the spring and he said, you know, I'm really pleased my daughter has taken an artificial insemination course just recently. I'm going to set her up so that we can synchronize these 100 heifers and she should be ready to go. And uh, that's, that's quite an undertaking um, for anyone to breed 100 heifers in a single day is, uh, is a lot of work. And I think for a new inseminator, um, you should probably set up five, uh, five maybe at the most, uh, ten if you think that you can handle it. Um, other than that, perhaps hire some technical support, see what you can do to, to help out. Um, if you want to pick up some, some of those females that didn't get pregnant from the fixed time AI when they return, certainly you could, you could practice with that. Um, I would also advise that uh, you get your first start in cows. They're, it's a lot easier to uh, pass the insemination gun in a cow than it is in a heifer. The other part of the solution equation is to use fixed time artificial insemination that Kathy was talking about earlier. 
Uh, costs for most fixed time time AI programs are reasonable, including the Seaman and Kathy went through those uh, with just three to four times through the shoot system. Lots of producers are very concerned about moving their animals through the shoot systems. Uh, they worry that the animals will become needle shy or they'll get get worse. And invariably, in the projects that we've run, is that each time through the shoot, the animals get quieter and more easy to handle. They get very much used to the shoot. And then follow-ups with producers have uh, indicated that they're generally happy with those females that were put through the AI program because they found them much easier to handle when it came to uh, calving time. They were used to human uh, intervention and being moved around in the system and so on. So, so it had uh, additional benefits that way. Drugs and disposables cost anywhere between $25 and $35 per cow. Um, and semen, I mean, it depends on what you want to put in. I put in semen doses as low as $10 if you're buying volume. Sometimes some bulls that have been around for a while, there is a, there's an opportunity to, to, to buy some good commercial quality semen at a very low price, $10, $5 even I've seen. Um, and then uh, on the purebred side, you may be using semen that's $50, even $100 a dose, if not more. But for most commercial producers, you can certainly get lots of good semen, uh, somewhere between $15 and $30 a dose. So that, that'll work quite well for you. Acceptable pregnancy rates to a single AI, so this is the answer to the uh, survey question. Uh, generally, we tell producers that they should be happy at about 50 to 60 percent. We get uh, below 50 percent. Uh, we want to do some things to, to tweak the system, take a look at what might have went wrong. Below 40 percent, I consider that to be uh, quite a disappointment. We really need to have a look at uh, anything we could do to make some changes. Uh, above 60%, I think is you should be very, very happy in that range, um, and then certainly above 70% is is generally quite exceptional. Um, natural service sires, um, you know, you could see in Kathy's study there on the natural service side that I think they had a uh, uh, first service conception rate over 80%, about 84%. Um, in reality, in most situations, it ranges between about 70 and perhaps as high as 85%, with numbers in the 70 be quite, 70s being quite typical. And in some projects we've done, we were quite surprised that we had uh, fertile bulls being turned out with, uh, with what we presume to be, uh, and in some cases proven to be, cycling females and had first service pregnancy rates in the uh, 60s percent. So the numbers can vary and, and, and management and, and uh, environment and, and a few other things can play a role in that. So timing of AI is uh, a few hours after estrus starts, um, um, perhaps mid, mid estrus if possible. Um, I like the few hours after estrus starts because again, estrus can be kind of short in there and we, uh, we certainly want to get in there before ovulation. So there was an old rule that uh, if you were observing heat and you saw a female in heat in the morning, so let's say you went out at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning and you saw her in heat, uh, then breed her in the afternoon the, the, and we call that the AM, PM rule. So the, you would breed her uh, perhaps at, at 5 or 6 o'clock at night. Likewise, if you saw her in the evening in heat, breed her the next morning, and that largely worked quite well. Other uh, work has shown that uh, if you see an animal in heat, breed them. Uh, that was particularly in dairy cows that they were having trouble displaying heats in there. And uh, one thing I've learned as a reproductive specialist and a veterinarian is uh, uh, for certain, if you don't put semen in there, you're not going to get that cow pregnant. So that's one thing I do know for sure. So we want to get in there before ovulation and talked about that already. And uh, time requ AI requires synchronized ovulation. So this fixed time, you get to pick the time when you want to inseminate those animals. She's not determining it for you. And that's one of the wonderful things about it. So how do we get there? Um, there's a couple of different uh, routes. The original stuff was estrus synchronization. I mean, we're uh, often these protocols that I'm talking about are called estrus synchronization protocols. Um, really, they're much more than that. The more modern protocols also synchronize follicular development. So the early estrus synchronization programs used uh, estermate or prostaglandin F2 alpha. Estermate is actually an analog, so it acts like the natural hormone. Um, examples were lutealized, estermate, esterplan are all available out there. They all work very well in estrus synchronization programs. So all these original estrus synchronization programs, all they did was to bring the animal into heat, um, and they really didn't control when she ovulated like the more modern uh, programs in synchronized follicular development. 
In these programs, what we do is we start a new wave of follicular development, and we basically do that by destroying a dominant follicle. As you might recall from those waves, you saw a number of follicles, and one of them gets to be big. That, that becomes the dominant follicle. And that dominant follicle can suppress all the other follicles that are there. And so what we're largely doing is we are destroying dominant follicles, and by doing that, we allow other follicles to develop up and grow under uh, regulations that we stipulate, and, and then it'll eventually ovulate when we want them to do that. So uh, one of the drugs we use that for that is estradiol, and of course another one is GnRH, uh, cisterone and fertiline being the examples. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what role progesterone, and that's in the form of the cedars that Kathy mentioned already, what role that plays in uh, regulating follicular development. So talking about the uh, prostaglandin and the analogs, we often just call them PGS. I mentioned already the products, and I've listed the doses here on the slide. Um, the, a single injection, so if we went into a group of animals that we knew were cycling, let's say we had a pen of cycling heifers, um, we went in there and we just put them all through the chute, we give them the intramuscular injection of Estramade or Lulize, we know that um, somewhere between 60 and 70% of them will display estrus from that shot. Now, the time from the shot to when they display estrus is quite variable, though. So we'll have some come in the, the next day after the shot. It could be argued that they were going to come into heat on their own. Some at two days, a very large peak at three days, a somewhat smaller number at four, five, and six days. So quite a range. And certainly, if you're looking at that, you say, how could I, how could I pick a time to AI them all off of that? And, and the answer to that is you just can't do it. You basically have to watch them for heats um, and, uh, and then and, and try to time your breeding then. It does have the advantage because it could take a, bring a large group of females into heat in a defined period of time. So instead of having to wait for the length of a, a heat cycle, if not more, the, 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 the 23 to 24 days, you could confine it into uh, largely a week period uh, with those that respond. Um, it does have that advantage, but it certainly is not good enough for fixed time artificial insemination. So out of uh, some work on the use of prostaglandin came what was called the double injection of prostaglandin. And basically, that involved two shots. And, and nowadays, they look at giving it two weeks apart. Um, perhaps some of you are familiar with two shots 11 days apart. Um, that worked really quite well. 14 days apart worked even better. And what it does is it just, it just actually, uh, by the time they get the second shot, more of the animals are concentrated in the ideal period of a cycle when they'll respond to a prostaglandin short shot. It's just as simple as that. Um, most of them, most animals will respond between 7 and 17 days of their cycle. And so with the two shots 14 days apart, we've got most of our animals in that window, 7 to 17 days, when they'll respond to that second prostaglandin shot. And it works really quite well. And we get a pretty good response rate. Much more predictable time to heat too because they're very much synchronous already in their cycles and so lots of work was done with uh, single time insemination using this protocol at uh, 72 to 80 hours post uh, prostaglandin improved pregnancy rates sorry were gathered from inseminating twice at 72 and 96 hours so you know if you bought $20 of straw semen you are now using $40 so for many, many years when we were developing the more modern protocols, we would compare it back to the double injection. That was kind of our old gold standard. We could get some pretty good pregnancy uh, results from that, for what we thought anyway. 50% uh, uh, pregnancy rates to a single insemination were possible, but often we fell short. Many times we were 37%, 45% uh, numbers like that. One of the things that surprises me still nowadays is uh, producers will uh, try a, a modern fixed time AI program with a cedar. Uh, they become frustrated. Uh, maybe their things didn't work out. Uh, maybe they feel that it was a little bit too expensive. And then they'll revert, ver, revert back to a double injection uh, prostaglandin type technique. And I'm, I'm disappointed when I see that. Um, um, you know, just to follow up, I'll hear that they use that. They maybe go for a season or two, um, and then uh, you know, I often will hear them asking lots more questions about getting getting back into cedars and, and trying that again. Every once in a while, I'll use a double injection prostaglandin in my own herd, um, but uh, I, again, I uh, try to combine that with uh, estrus detection. And uh, I'll use it simply because it's it's simple to use, but uh, but I I usually have to employ estrus detection in there to 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 make it work uh, as well as I'd like. 
So let's talk about synchronizing follicular development. So we mentioned already the follicles contain the eggs and we will need to control when they ovulate. And the follicles, their, their development has to be regulated because they need to be at a certain stage of development to respond to the drugs that make them ovulate. So not only do we want them to ovulate on time, um, and we can make that happen, but we have to have them in the appropriate window of time so that they'll respond to the drugs that we give them. So we have to control their development. So there are many, many protocols out there to uh, assist with this, and uh, this can be a very, very confusing area for uh, both producers and also for veterinary students that I teach. They just get overwhelmed by all the different synchronization protocols that are available today. So some basic things that will hopefully help you understand is that um, uh, we have luteinizing hormone, and that's a natural hormone in the cow that actually triggers ovulation. And before that is a GnRH, Okay, this is called gonadotropin releasing hormone. This comes from the hypothalamus, which is up in the brain. It comes down to the pituitary to cause the release of luteinizing hormone. This GnRH, or gonadotropin releasing hormone, we actually have synthetic forms. Uh, and cysterellin is an example, and fertiline is an example, factrel is another example that's out there. So we can actually inject this, mimic that GnRH release from the brain, and trigger a luteinizing hormone release in the cow to make ovulation occur when there's an appropriate size follicle there. So uh, we, can, we can do all that nowadays. So with follicles, now typically an ovulatory follicle in a cow is somewhere between 18 and 20 millimeters. In heifers, it might be a little bit smaller at 14 to 15 millimeters. We know that um, we can make ovulation occur in a follicle that's somewhere between 8 and 10 millimeters and bigger. We know once we do that, we make it ovulate, whether or not we breed her or not, we've taken away that dominant follicle and we'll get a new wave of follicles emerging usually within about two days after. And uh, lots of times in our protocols, when, uh, as in Kathy's example, when they gave that GnRH at the beginning of the program, uh, they started a new wave of follicular development within two days. And with their seeder on board, they were then controlling this wave of follicular development ultimately to cause their timed uh, uh, ovulation. So we can use GnRH, we can also use estradiol for our synchronization, or we can substitute luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone is not used a lot in the industry uh, because of manufacturing processes that is quite a bit expensive, quite quite a bit more expensive than GnRH or even estradiol. Estradiol is an off-label type of use. It needs to be compounded and, and sold by prescription by veterinarians. It is quite a bit less expensive than GnRH, and to some degree, it is more uh, more effective in many cases. But we uh, we have a tendency to try and avoid it. Um, in, in many circumstances because of uh, negative uh, connotations with using estradiols in food animals. So um, you uh, may or may not be able to get your hands on it uh, depending on who you are working with. So similarly, we want to have synchronous ovulation as well. And uh, at the other end of the spectrum, when we're getting ready to uh, breed, we can, we can induce ovulation, again, with estradiol, GnRH, or LH. So to kind of summarize this slide is we use GnRH, or estradiol to start a new follicular wave. We control the development of that wave, and then at the other end, we can use GnRH again or estradiol to trigger ovulation so that we uh, have that occurring in all at once pretty well in this group of females and so that we can inseminate them. So what about progesterone? And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a cedar. This is a bit of a busy slide here. There's lots of stuff on here. Uh, but uh, we've known for many, many years, progesterone was one of the first things that came out for manipulating estrocycles cycles in cattle. And uh, we knew that it suppressed this luteinizing hormone um, pulses in the cows in a dose-dependent fashion. So that meant that the more progesterone you gave, the more suppression. So when you suppress luteinizing hormones, not only can follicles not ovulate naturally, they also don't finish developing. You see, follicles need that luteinizing hormone to finish growing up to get to their mature size, and then also they need a surge of the luteinizing hormone to ultimately ovulate. So by putting progesterone on board, we actually suppress that luteinizing hormone and allow that hormone to build up in levels, and once we pull the progesterone out, we get really, really nice surges, and then we, uh, again, that helps us to to, to synchronize our ovulations. A few little tidbits about progesterone is uh, we knew that low levels of it, so and that's what happens when you put cedars in or you feed it in the form of uh, melangestrol acetate or MGA. Um, those low levels for too long 
gave us large persistent dominant follicles. And that's why you're going to see programs that tend to be uh, seven days to perhaps eight days uh, long. If you get too long, then, then we have persistent dominant follicles. They're basically like having uh, chicken eggs in the fridge that go past their best before date. They just, they just don't, they have poor quality eggs in them and we get poor quality fertilization uh, rates. So progestins also, um, so these are the non, so cedars have natural progesterone in them. Progestins, again, this is like the feed avidus. They not only, when they're fed for long periods of time, they just tend to be weaker than natural progesterone and so they just don't have quite the same effect and they are more likely than natural progesterone to cause persistent dominant follicles. Okay, so I mentioned already some of those products, the progestin, so the non-natural ones that mimic. MGA is the most common that's, that's in the feed. Nargestimate's no longer on the market. Some of you might have heard of uh, Synchromate B, Crestar ear implants. Uh, some of these implants have been gone for about 20 years. Um, they were more commonly available in the U.S. and uh, I don't even think they're on the market anymore. In terms of progesterone releasing devices, we now only have the CEDAR in Canada. CEDAR stands for Controlled Internal Drug, drug Release. Um, about two years ago, the PRID, which is kind of a coily device, uh, which stood for progesterone releasing intravaginal device, that uh, was taken off the market. And it, there weren't any problems with it. It just was not competing well. There were not enough sales uh, for the company when they were competing directly against the CEDAR, and the CEDAR had the lion's share of the market. Largely, the cedar uh, had the ability to stay in place. There was just a higher fallout rate with prids, and so producers were often disappointed if they set up 10 cows and two of them lost their prids, whereas with the cedars, the fallout rate is much less. So if you've never seen a cedar before, here's a picture of one here. Um, this is the T-shaped portion. Uh, we basically insert this long portion into the applicator, fold up the T-shaped portion, uh, insert it into the vagina, release it, and then the T kind of spreads it spreads out the top part of the T, and it stays in place there uh, for the uh, duration. And so when we want to remove it, we just grab this plastic tail and we just slide it on out, and and you can dispose of it in a garbage can. If you've never seen this before, it's very very common that there's a lot of mucus and uh, sometimes almost looks like pus on the uh, cedars when you pull them out. That's actually a really normal finding. I get lots of phone calls uh, from beginners about that every year, and that's normal. Anything that's foreign in the vagina, um, it, there'll be a, there'll be a reaction to it, but it certainly will not hurt your pregnancy rates at all. It's actually kind of a normal uh, result. So synchronization of follicular waves. Um, so I've mentioned already the use of uh, estradiol 17 beta instead of GnRH to start a new wave um, and then putting the cedars in and I've thrown this slide in to show you that with the different protocols you have a variable uh, time to the emergence of a new wave and that's sometimes what we work on that's that's the kind of stuff we pay attention to when we look at durations of programs or when is the most ideal time to breed. If you remember back the slide that showed GnRH um, or Cisterellin showed that the new wave emerged in two days after, uh, after the start of the protocol. In this case, it's four days. So I happen to be a person who has been still using the CEDAR program uh, with an estrogen, and so I will tend to have no problem breeding these cows at seven, or half, seven and a half, or sorry, leaving the CEDAR in place for seven and a half to eight days, and then breeding after that, a period of time after that, just allowing those follicles just to get a little bit bigger for me. So I mentioned to you that there's a lot of different protocols out there. And so this one is really, really busy. Don't get too upset right away if you don't understand uh, what's going on. What you'll see is a common thing up here is that we do have a cedar in place or a progesterone insert, and you'll see seven days used here. We also give the example of MGA. MGA goes into the feed. Um, it is a progestin, and uh, it will work quite well in some programs. What we have seen is, is that we have problems with intake, variable intake in groups of animals, um, really awkward using it with uh, cows with calves at foot because the calves will also get into the grain. And uh, we've also had some troubles with making sure that it gets mixed in. Because it's in the feed and it needs to be metabolized, you'll see that they're only feeding it for six days, when in actual fact it probably stays in the system for seven. In these protocols, you always see the prostaglandin being given at seven days. That's the old estromate or the lutealize. 
um, even though you pulled your cedar out, that's been your progesterone source, we must give that just in case the cow has her own natural corpus luteum, just to make sure that that's destroyed. Because any source of progesterone that we have on board is going to limit that cow's ability to ovulate. Over here, you see this long arrow at the uh, beginning of the protocols. Uh, what we have there is uh, various things that we can use to start a new follicular wave. So you see the example of GnRH. That would be 100 micrograms is your dose, b or fertiline. Uh, here you see EB. That's one that we've used quite a bit in our projects. That's estradiol benzoate. And here is estradiol 17 beta. Basically, they're estrogens. And then sometimes some progesterones are given on board. And, and uh, each one of these protocols, if you choose to, to have a look at them, you can discuss them further with, uh, with your veterinarians and see what their thoughts are. And, and uh, failing that, you can always give me a call here at the Western College of Vet Medicine and I'll answer your questions with regard to using these, these various hormones. So when we're looking over here, um, generally speaking, from the time of cedar pole till the time that we inseminate, usually is going to be about 56 hours, plus or minus two. In some protocols, we can bring the animals through. Um, we pull the cedars at day seven. 24 hours later, we pull them, at, bring them through at day eight. We can give them a shot of estrogen then. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that might help to, to synchronize uh, uh, ovulation a little bit better. Largely, uh, in my own protocols, I've dropped this use of estrogen here uh, because what I found was uh, even though the animals were going to ovulate for me um, a while later, like the next day or the next, uh, I was going to breed them by the, the next evening, um, what I found was with the estrogen on board, there would be a lot of um, riding activity. And in large groups of animals, I invariably had one or two smaller cows that were ridden really hard, so they were knocked down and they would be sore and they'd be lame. So I've largely dropped this estrogen from the, from the protocol in favor of inseminating at the 56 hours and giving that second shot of cysterellin, or, or in other words, GnRH, uh, to cause a synchronous ovulation. So what we are typically using, and I'll go through the, pro the protocol that Kathy used, so that was 100 micrograms of GnRH at the beginning. They also put a cedar implant in. They left that for seven days. They uh, gave a shot of prostaglandin when they pulled the cedar out. And basically 56 plus or minus two hours later, they brought the animals back through the system, inseminated them, and gave them a shot of GnRH to induce uh, uh, ovulation in a synchronous faction. And that basically was the CoSync program that she used, which is combining the GnRH at the fixed time AI, and that's co-sync and plus, plus a cedar on board. We'll show you that in a second. This is uh, from the old off-sync program. I uh, threw this one in here. This is one of the original uh, kind of sync programs from the mid to late 90s. Um, and, and the difference between off-sync and co-sync is in off-sync, they basically gave the shot of GnRH, and then they AI 12 to 16 hours later. Um, in dairy cows, we will have slightly higher pregnancy rates when we separate that GnRH and AI, but it means that you handle the animals four times. In the CoSync program, you are combining your second GnRH and fixed time AI, so it's really one, two, three times through the shoot. So the Cedar devices really enhance these protocols. They uh, give you a higher pregnancy rate. They're absolutely important in heifers. The, uh, these protocols without a cedar do not work well in heifers. Heifers are ovulating smaller follicles, and um, uh, their, their follicles are basically, uh, for lack of better words, they're much harder to control their development. And so what happens without the use of the cedars in these programs in heifers is that the many heifers will, uh, you give that shot of GnRH without a cedar, some of them will start coming into heat uh, before you give the prostaglandin and it really upsets producers. I mean, if they're combining it with a, a little bit of artificial insemination, you can certainly pick up those heifers showing heat early, but if you're for that and you're really wanting to focus on uh, fixed time AI, then that can be problematic. Also, the cedar is important in anesterous cows. These are cows that aren't yet cycling. Um, and uh, I think uh, anesterous cows, you shouldn't think that that's a small percentage of cows. That could be a lot of cows in that, that postpartum period. Uh, generally speaking, we want to have our cows at least uh, 50, 60 days postpartum uh, before we start these programs. If there's been some nutritional challenges, she's milking heavy or whatever, uh, they may not. They may actually be an anesterous. And the use of the cedar in there can actually improve their pregnancy rates to the fixed time AI. And in fact, even if they don't get pregnant to the fixed time AI, 
try, it will improve their pregnancy rates at subsequent cycles. So it can be uh, uh, quite a handy thing to use there and, and certainly uh, uh, we should look at the effect of that uh, on, in an economic study at some point. So this is another example. This one happens to be using the estradiol and the cedar. Um, so they use estradiol benzoate weight at the beginning. This was the estradiol benzoate weight at day eight. And again, this 24 plus 32 hours adds up to 56 hours for the fixed time AI. So fix 56 hours from the time that you pull the cedar is a, is a very, very common number to, to use. So uh, kind of wrapping up this talk, Protocols that are currently in use, not all the drugs are approved uh, for use, um, especially the estrogens are off-label. Most of them are prescription, requiring a prescription from your veterinarian. Um, some of them vary in the degree of synchrony achieved and so on, and that, again, that's uh, something for you to discuss. So uh, choosing your protocol, um, get in touch with your vet in your disseminator. As Kathy pointed out, they used uh, a technician that uh, worked with one of the uh, semen supply companies. Um, I know who they're using. He's very, very good, does a good job. He's not upset by breeding, having to breed 100 animals uh, in a day at your farm. So that works very, very well. Um, Choosing, choosing a protocol can be daunting. You can, again, work with your vet or work with that person that's doing the inseminating to pick a program. I like to have, pick something that's simple. Don't get too complicated and, uh, and go with that. Make sure that your vaccinations are done beforehand. Um, it should be completed at least two weeks before the beginning of a protocol. Depending on who you talk to, some people will say six weeks, some say will, will say a month, uh, but certainly at least two to three weeks. Some of the modified live vaccines, the BVD in there can cause inflammation in the ovaries and uh, perhaps uh, cause you to have a decreased pregnancy rate. Um, modified live IVR in the vaccines uh, can also uh, mess with uh, luteinizing hormone levels and uh, perhaps upset the, the chance to ovulate. So certainly um, it's a bad idea to be vaccinating with uh, modified live vaccines at the time that you bring those females through the, the chute to put the cedars in or to AI them. So please stay away from that. Get it done beforehand. Uh, I can't say enough of, uh, good things about having great management skills. It's doing a lot of little things right. So uh, making sure that those animals are on a rising plane of nutrition, um, that they're uh, all mineral and, and uh, energy and protein needs are, are being met. Um, if you're housing them in a paddock, Make sure there's a good bedding area. Wet, sloppy, dirty uh, paddocks can be stressful for animals. Stress on them can influence uh, ovulation rates and, uh, and overall response to these programs. So make sure that they're clean, dry, and happy, and, and that they're, they're well fed. So synchronization and AI complement really, really good management. In terms of body weight on heifers, um, we talk about them being somewhere between 55 and 65 percent of mature weight. They don't have to be too big. Um, the 55 percent um, was uh, studied uh, quite extensively at Western Beef Development Center and uh, has proved out to be uh, okay to, to grow them that, to that size, and it works quite well with uh, no uh, apparent long-term effects to those females. So you can save yourself a little bit in feeding costs uh, by, by looking at a uh, little bit smaller body size. So cows, actually I mentioned here at least 40 days postpartum, that would be a challenge. If I can get them 50 and 60 days uh, postpartum, that would be better. In our herd, um, if we're doing a lot of AI, last year we AI'd two-thirds of the females in, in, uh, in a 60 cow herd, and I'll do them in waves. So I'll take the first group of cows uh, that, that calve the earliest, and they'll go in a group, and perhaps two or three week, weeks later, I'll bring those cows that are maybe were only 40 days or 35 days uh, postpartum at the time of, uh, of the first group of cows that went through. So that's the kind of stuff that we try to do there. Just make sure that that uterus has enough time to clean up and that the cow has resumed normal cyclicity. Uh, body condition score animals, just feed is appropriate. Uh, planning communication is important with your inseminator and with the people that are doing this. Written protocols, I insist on these, um, whether you're working with your AI technician or with a veterinarian. Uh, people that come and see me to get set up on protocols, I give them a written protocol. We usually start off by what day do you want to breed? Um, and do you have enough help? Because that's the, that's the most time-consuming part is the AIing, and, uh, and it's most time-sensitive, and you want to make sure that you have adequate help and you're able to move them through the chute. So once we pick that, then we basically work backwards with our protocol. We make sure it's written down, and um, I like to use, uh, when I'm using drugs, 
I like to make sure that every drug that's going into a syringe is two cc's because you don't know how many times that mistakes are made. Uh, they give the wrong drug or they give the wrong volume of the drug. Um, some of the people that I've been working with, they in fact have gone to using uh, single-use syringes and they like to preload them so that they can look at them and make sure that the syringes are all ready to go and, uh, and, and treat the cows. And uh, uh, certainly when I've seen that being employed, there's been almost no mistakes made in doing that. So make sure you have adequate facilities and adequate labor. If you have a rickety rundown shoot, uh, perhaps you want to change that before we get into this kind of stuff. Lots of people get worried about calving. So they think if we inseminate it all in one day that they will actually all calve in one day. And the reality is that that's not the case. Um, what's uh, typically going to happen is they're going to calve over about a 14-day period. You will have a peak. Um, I heard about a 60 uh, heifer scenario a couple of days ago where the guy actually, he was too happy with his protocol. He wants to have a, a poor quality protocol because uh, he said all 60 of the heifers that caught on his protocol calved within five days and he found that a little bit overwhelming. Um, so so you got to prepare yourself for that type of a scenario if it should come along, especially if you're cold weather calving. You need to be able to handle a large number of calves in a short period of time. With that, are there any questions for me? All right, thanks, Colin. So we do have lots of questions coming in here, actually, for both you and Kathy. So um, I will just get Kathy to also turn on her microphone and share on um, her webcam as well. And we will get going with some of the questions here. So as I said, um, there's lots coming in. If you do have any questions for either Kathy or Colin, please type them into the chat box on the side of your screen. Um, if your control panel has closed, you should see an orange arrow near the top where you can click on that and it'll expand and then you can use the chat window as well. Your questions here are also anonymous, so I will read them out loud and I will, um, either Kathy or Colin will answer them. All right. So first one here for Colin. So are, do you have any comments on the use of sex semen in beef cattle? And are there any modifications to the fixed time AI protocols when using sex semen? Oh, that's a great question. Um, th that question comes up from time to time. So still with sex semen, there's been a lot of improvements made with it, um, but you are going to take uh, basically a hit on your conception rates with sex semen. Um, the handling of the sex semen uh, compromises it a little bit, and so uh, off the top of my head, and then this is in, in talking with uh, George Seidel, who's actually worked on developing it, you should probably expect at least a 20% decrease in your conception rates with sex semen in your fixed time AI protocols. Now, the second part of that question was, is is there any uh, work done on timing with regard to it? Um, and there has been a small amount uh, done with sex semen. They were, were looking at a double insemination, so inseminating them a little bit earlier than the 56 hours. I think they were looking at 48 hours and then inseminating again 24 hours later. Um, there was some work that showed a bit of a benefit to that. Now, we have a project that we did using conventional semen in several different bowls. It was an adopt project. Um, we have the data all collected. We just have to get that published. Um, and we looked at uh, the double insemination versus the single. And certainly with, with regular semen, non-sex semen, we, there really was no benefit to the uh, the double insemination overall across the project with that. So um, so anyway, that's where we're at. So they think with the, their double insemination might help with the sex semen because it's been compromised. Um, but certainly there's lots more work to be done there. Okay. All right. So a second question for you, Colin. Do you recommend using a cedar more than once? And is there a difference in conception rate if it is used more than once? That's a great question too. We used to find that you could use cedars up to three times. That was the old cedar. They had more progesterone in them. Um, and then that, maybe that third time was a little bit questionable, but certainly twice. Um, and I think even today with the, new, the newer cedars, they have a lower level. I think they're 1.33 uh, grams of progesterone in them versus 1.8. Um, that you can still use them twice. What we found is that a lot of producers aren't using them twice. They'll use them single use. Um, even in our herd, um, we're, we're using them single use. I've spent a lot of money on the semen usually and the other aspects of the program, and I, and I really don't like putting a once-use cedar in. But where I will, I do save them and where I do use them is on those cows that aren't going to be um, uh, 
put into a fixed time AI protocol. We'll use those on cows that are, are a bit later. We'll put them, we'll give them that cedar that gives them an exposure to progesterone, gets them cycling a little bit sooner for us, and then we'll turn them out with a bull. So that's kind of another another talk that I could do sometime of managing postpartum cows or anesterous cows, but that's where we use them. And how we clean them up is uh, we just basically put them in a pail of water. I use gloves and I use just a mild soap like an ivory and wash them. Uh, one of my colleagues has gone so far as to uh, put them in a washing machine, a household washing machine, and wash them with Tide and said they were still effective. Um, I'm just, my wife won't let me uh, use our washing machine for that purpose, so I've been, uh, I've been stuck using them in a pail, and I just try to get all the feces off them and wash them. Um, certainly, I, I don't think it's a good idea to be uh, sharing them with neighbors. I think they should, if you're going to reuse them, they need to stay within one herd so that you uh, uh, limit disease spread. And uh, or even uh, uh, you know vaginal bacteria and so on are, are probably somewhat unique to to your herd and you don't want to kind of spread things around too much. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next question is for Kathy. So, in Kathy, can you just comment on using AI in smaller operations when they still have to use or maintain a cleanup bowl? So, is it economical in that sense? Uh, okay, so yeah, that will make a that will definitely probably increase your cost because you're looking how I did it is that essentially it was a banking on having uh, half the bull power needed I could cut in half um, if you have only say 30 cows you're gonna still have to have at least one bull around um, it's gonna increase your cost somewhat but I, I, I think that there's probably some merit there in just the quality of bulls that you can get your hands on possibly as well um, that might make it worth your while All right. So you'd have to go through working those numbers out for yourself. Sounds good. Um, so another question for Colin here. So um, can you just comment on giving vitamin E and selenium at the same time that um, cedars are being being inserted with GnRH? Is there any conflict there? Um, can't see a problem with it. Um, I've seen a few of your herds that have used it, vit vitamin E and selenium or... Um, um, yeah, I guess that vitamin A, D, and E is the other one. Um, certainly if you're using clean needles, because uh, sometimes uh, people tend to use uh, dirty needles and if you develop an abscess and, and with that she's, you know, she has an infection and a fever, that could affect her ability to ovulate in the program, but uh, uh, without that occurring I can't see it being a problem. Um, those vitamins really should have been on board before you started the program program ideally. Um, you know, follicles that are developing, even in these fixed time AI programs, um, uh, often have developed or begun their development actually a few months or several weeks before they're actually going to ovulate. So they're influenced by a metabolic environment that, that, that was existing uh, quite a few weeks before you start the protocol in so many words. So um, if, if you do have a vitamin type of program and you're hoping to solve that by an injection at the start of the protocol, I think that uh, you're not likely to do that. I uh, think you're not likely to cause any harm unless you have, you know, dirty needles or injection site programs. But uh, I would look at at giving my, if I'm using injectables, I'd give that well in advance of the protocol, or I would adjust my feed, look at a feed analysis and adjust it appropriately, and 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 make sure they get it that way. All right. So another question for you, Colin. So um, a producer here was talking about uh, using estradiol, and they found that heifers were showing signs of heat for two to three days so and we're kind of confused as to when they were actually in heat okay so were they using estradiol on uh, on day eight of the program I'm not sure it doesn't say here I would guess that that's when they were using it yeah I don't have any further information so okay well, I'll comment on it anyway. Um, so that estradiol, and, and so I've seen those problems, especially when you don't have a cedar on board. So if you were using estradiol at the beginning of the program and you put a cedar on board, that cedar will, will take away heat. Um, so any animal that's in heat, you can basically put a cedar on board, and within a couple of hours, progesterone levels are going to rise to some, enough, of enough of a level to, to obliterate estrus so that they're not going to display heat. So most likely the problem was being seen when they were in 
injecting estrogen on day eight. And uh, that's the same problem that I saw as they start displaying estrus. In fact, I had a, an, a very experienced uh, friend that was by the, you know, in the early years when I was using that protocol. He was very, very concerned that those animals were, were displaying heat easily a day and a half before I was supposed to be breeding them and that I needed to be getting those cows in and bred. Uh, bread. Uh, what I can say is uh, stay the course. Go with the time. That Those signs that you're seeing early, don't worry about it. Uh, we've seen so many animals uh, in heat. We've had uh, as many as three kind of piled up in a, in a tandem riding scenario. Um, so it, it, it can be overwhelming. We've also seen dust storms where they're just milling around and they're so active and, and uh, mixing it up so much and they've rubbed hair off. But uh, just stay the course with your time and uh, just, just try to ignore what's going on out there in terms of behavior. Great. Thank you. So another question for Kathy here. So could you please comment further, um, are there any possible reasons for the increase in weaning weight that you saw when using fixed time AI? Okay, so on the, if you, if the table that I showed actually, sometimes I think that we think if we use AI bulls that we end up getting a, a, a bull that ends up with higher weaning weights. And so in the chart that I showed you with the adjusted weights, the fixed time calves actually have lower weaning weights. Um, and, and it's just a matter of um, those calves, some of those calves were born a bit younger and so maybe some of the adjustments that were made, it just uh, didn't get quite to where things needed to be. But I ended up with more pounds overall in the end anyways, just due to better conception rates. I'm not sure if that's exactly what the question is that the person's asking and I welcome them to follow up with me afterwards if it, that wasn't exactly what they were getting at. Sounds good. All right, so we do have a lot more questions coming in here still, but I think we're going to call it quits here. Um, we're about 20 minutes over time anyways, but I know that both Kathy and Colin have said they'd be happy to answer um, questions that you do have, so uh, you can also talk to your local veterinarian or AI tech about any of these questions that you had. And I will also be following up, as I mentioned with this webinar, with uh, some follow-up links to provide some additional information as well. So I thank you very much for your questions, but we're just gonna call our quits there. So just a few last things before we go. So the first thing is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. So you can go to our website, beefresearch.ca and click the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you have a Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube account, you can connect with us there as well. And I would also encourage you to visit the Canadian Cattlemen's Association website, cattle.ca, where you can sign up for their newsletter, Action News, as well. So as soon as this webinar is over, I will ask, a short survey will come up and that will ask you about tonight's webinar and what you found most interesting in for future webinar topics. We do really appreciate your feedback because it allows us to do a better information or better job at delivering information that's both useful and meaningful for you and helps you make decisions on your operation. So please complete that survey for us and don't hesitate to contact myself with questions, comments or suggestions at any time. You're also going to be receiving an email from me within a couple of days, as I mentioned, with the link to watch the recording as well as some resources in there as well. Also, be sure not to mix our next webinar. It will be February 21st, well, or February 24th, sorry, where we'll be talking about practical applications of forage rejuvenation. So that's it for the night. Um, I'd like to thank everybody at home for joining us. And on behalf of everyone, I'd like to thank Kathy and Colin for volunteering your time and expertise tonight. So You're welcome. You. You're welcome. Goodbye.